나영 씨잘 들리나요? 아, 네, 잘 들립니다. 오케이, okay, so let's start today. So today is going to be the, in some sense, the final lecture of the course. So next week we will have, we will meet, but it's going to be, I mean, the classes are going to be about Q&A. So if you post, I mean, post some questions in the KLMS by the deadline that I mentioned, I will have a look at them and then I will discuss about them in, in the, on Monday and Wednesday. Okay. Also, if there are no questions, then I may pick like one or two questions myself and then I will talk about them. Okay. So, well, where are we now? So we have discussed about, uh, let me activate some few things, discussed about continuation last time. Right, and then mainly I, I gave some motivations about why one might care about continuations and where continuations are used in the design and analysis of programming languages. And, and then the, after that, I talk quite a bit about the continuation-based semantics, which, so it's a quick reminder. I talk about continuation-based semantics or simply you can call it continuation semantics. And in that semantics, the semantics of the expressions is going to take, so it's a mapping from expressions to uh, environments to, but traditionally it was a mapping from environment to computations or the V star, but in the continuation semantics, it takes some additional things, which is called V count. And then where V count is defined as mapping from continuous map from V to V star. So continuous map, so on. So intuitively what this semantics does is that it uh, express what's happening, so even that in this continuation semantics, it express what's happening by the program E or expression E in the, in the language that we are talking about. But at the same time, it also talk about how, what's gonna happen after the, when we, fi when we finish the computation of E. So for instance, so we talk about computation of E.
together with the rest of the computation denoted by k, by kappa. So I think the tip you, the best way to understand this is to see a typical example. So if we've seen number three, eta and kappa. Traditionally, we just return three and modular some embedding. But in this case, we return three, but at the same time, we invoke kappa, which represent the rest of the computation. So, and the right definition is we uh, convert three into a value by invoking this embedding map or iota int, so that this becomes a value. Then once it becomes a value, we invoke the continuation so that we express, I mean, with this semantics, uh, describe the entire things, including evaluation of this expression three, as well as the evaluation of the rest of the computation. So that's the, what we have done. And then a few key things is that we, when we do this, we change, I mean, our V is defined by the isomorphism, but one of the case of the isomorphism was a function, but then definition of function is changed such that it is not just a mapping from value to V star or computation, but it also take a continuation. So that's what we did last time. So see that extra continuation part appears in the interpretations, the semantic definitions of expression, this guy, as well as the semantics of the, the semantic domain for functions. Okay, what we're gonna do today is, I mean, this is more like we are just redoing our semantics uh, for the same, well, we, we take exactly the same language and we provide a new type of semantics for that language. And one reason for doing this is and once we do this, then we can, it, I mean, this is semantics allows us to uh, it, well, give a good hint about how we can extend the language to include much more powerful so-called control operator. So what we're gonna do today mainly is we will study, we will look at two programming language con construct called core CC and something called the throw. These are so-called control operators. So we will study about these operators, mainly using the semantic tools that we developed. And then we do some programming with the core CC and throw. I mean, especially we will program so-called back backtracking mechanisms using core CC and throw. And the last bit I want to talk a little bit, if I time allows, is so-called defunctionalization. Who are in the textbook, we said first order denotation of semantics. So this is the denotation of semantics, which have, which uses programming at the syntax of the language quite a lot, and then also form the basis of the so-called deep functionalization step in the compiler for functional languages. Okay, okay let's just start with the core CC and throw. So let me start with some high level intuitions about core CC and throw. Core CC is a bit like putting label in C or maybe Java or maybe, I'm not sure about Python, but in C or Java, you can describe a jump and then core CC, and then you, when you describe jump, you have to identify where to jump to and then label is used to describe this target of jump. And core CC is a, is a functional way 
of putting, I mean, one way to understand course C is a functional way of putting label in a, in a, in a functional language. And throw is, is a bit like a jump, it's a go, like a go-to. But they are much more powerful than simple uh, label putting and then I mean, just go to operations in C or Java or other imperative languages. Okay. So, so let me start with the syntax of courses C and throw. The syntax is, so we have an abstract grammar and we add two more cases one case is course C and expression. And throw, take two expressions. And then what we are expecting, the expected argument of course C is a function. And what the function does is that it, I mean, I will first say it and then explain it more. This is a function that takes a continuation. So once we include this course C and throw, this, the language get expanded. So the, the kind of things we can denote using expressions in this language is not just integer, boolean, function, tuple, and alternative. We have a one more case, that one more case is correspond to continuation. So in the, when we write course C, the parameter of course C is a function, and that, that is expecting continuation as a parameter. And then for throw, it takes a two expressions. And the first expression is expected to produce continuation. And then second is a some value. I mean, you compute some value that, so you said for second, it can be anything, but first it has to be a continuation. So let me show you some examples. I mean, maybe some very abstract <laughs> example first. So they, when you write course C, we often, the parameter of course C is a function. So often write it like kappa and expression E. I mean, so, well, let's not write kappa. So let me just make, maybe make you more confused. Some X dot E. So that's a argument of course C, but it's, it's a function and then K the intuitively what course C does is that it binds current continuation to X. And then continue the evaluation of the expression E. Okay. And then for throw, it takes two argument E1 and E2. And what it does is that it evaluate E1 that will produce some continuation. And then it, it, it returns to this continuation with the result of the second argument E2. Okay. Again, I know that it's not very understandable. So let me show you. Uh, so I think maybe let me just write it this way. So suppose we have uh, this course C expression and throw inside of some big program. So we have a big expression at some point, it turns out, I mean, it, so it is then the day what I'm writing here is the next things to evaluate, but the next thing to evaluate is a course C. And then we have lambda X. And inside this lambda X, suppose we are calling throw of X and may say value three. So, so then by the time, so when, okay, when we evaluate this course C with this argument, 
I said x is going to be bound to current continuation. And last time when I explain, I mean explaining, explain continuation, I said continuation is something that we need to do after we com complete the computation of the, the, the expression we have right now. In this case, continuation will correspond to this is surrounding expressions. Why is that? That's because once you finish the computation of the yellow part, we have to plug in the result to, uh, to this. Uh, we have to replace this yellow part by the result and then continue this uh, I mean purple part with a new result plugged in, okay? So the continuation correspond to, uh, so continuations, will correspond to this purple uh, pro expression with a big one big hole that correspond uh, that's uh, correspond to this yellow thing. So, so this is going to be continuation, and that continuation will be bound to this one is going to be bound to x. Okay. So another way to think about it is that we, when you call invoke call CC, we are generating a label, you know, and then putting label at this position here. Okay, so so we take this entire expression, entire program, and we put a label L here. And then now we continue the execution. When you call call CC, we put a label here, and then we bind X to the this entire outside expression, a surrounding expression with a label, and then we continue the evaluation. And now, if, it, if the things to evaluate at some point is a throw, where X is the continuation that is bound by the core CC, what we are going to do is that we're gonna jump to the place denoted by the continuation for X. So in this case, X is going to be this continuation with a label L. So we're gonna jump to, let's use a glue. So when you call throw, okay. so, so when you call throw, then we look at X, X we said we figure out, I mean, at the point we can, we can know that X is a continuation with a label L. So we decide to jump to L, but now when you jump to L, we use number three as the parameter, the value that we want to plug in to the horse in the continuation. So if the, at some point we invoke throw X3, we're gonna jump and then we will plug, plug in number three there and then to continue the evaluation, okay? So for instance, Here are just some example program. So if you call invoke, okay, call CC. Okay. Okay, three times four. And maybe plus twenty. Okay, so if you if we invoke this uh, I mean run this com expression, then What's going to happen is that we first evaluate the first argument of the plus. But when we evaluate the core CC, we grab the current continuation, which is going to be some core plus number 20, because that's the things that needs to be evaluated after core CC. So this is the, this represents the current continuation. We put a label L here and that's going to be bound to K, okay? And then now the next thing to evaluate is the two plus something, two plus 
So we have to evaluate the second argument of the plus. Now, when we evaluate the second argument, we evaluate through k, and then k is going to be, I mean, this one, the whole with L together with the 20. So what throw does is that we jump to the label, the, the place where we are, we label, put a label L. And then when we jump there, we plug in the parameter three times four. So three times four is the 20, 12. So 12 is plugged in to this hole there. And then the final outcome is going to be the evaluation of this guy that will be uh, 32. Okay. So there's something is not quite right. So there was some synchronization problem. So uh, I hope you understand what's happening. If we invoke a core CC, we take the current continuation, which is the surrounding context of the program that we are evaluating right now. And another way to understand this is we are generating some label L to the positions of core CC. And then this K is gonna be bound to the current continuation in this case, we can approximately correspond to this label L. And then when we invoke throw, then we are jumping to the label denoted by K. So we jump to this label with a value that's the result of three times four. So that's going to be number 12 plus 20. And then that will get evaluated as 32. Okay. So can see that core CC is a bit like a generating a label. So it's, it's really core with the current continuation. So that's what this core CC means. But it's a, some people say it's a grabbing the current continuation and bind it to K. But another way to think about this is generating label L and throw can be understood as jumping to that label uh, of the first parameter. Okay. So now here are just some exercise I want you to think about. So think about what's going to be the result of the following. I mean, this is not very easy, but because it, I mean, this shows that you can do something extremely strange using continuation. So I will give you uh, three minutes to think about what's going to be the outcome, output of this. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, what will be the result of evaluating uh, this expression?
Okay, so the result is 12. Okay, so that, how does it work? So if you, when you call call CC, okay, and then if you call the, with a parameter that's written here, K is going to be bound to the current continuation, which is going to be put a label L with a whole together with the six. Okay. And then now the majority is this function. And the function will be returned. So we will have from the X throw K lambda Y X plus Y apply to number six. And then this function application, I mean, this is not exactly the small step, the, the contraction relation, but it roughly describes how computation proceed. So then X will get bound to number six and the evaluation will continue. So if X get bound to number six, we have zero K lambda Y X will bound to number six, so six plus y. Okay. Now k is is bound to here this guy. So in, in both cases. And maybe these four things. So k will bound here. Now I said that throw k is like a jump. So something strange happens here. We mean at this point we go back to the original context where core CC is invoked. Okay. So we go back there and then we plug in, I mean, this lambda expression, lambda y six plus y to this position. So then the next step is going to be, we jump to L because K is bound to L and then we plug in this lambda. So we have, lambda y, six plus y. And, and then we evaluate this application again. Okay. Now, if we evaluate this application again, y is gonna be bound to six. So we have a six plus six, and that will be evaluated number 12. So one funny thing that's happening here is that if we use a core CC, this function application is, is uh, applied twice. Once when core CC and lambda, this, uh, the argument of functions of course is returns. And then second time when throw is invoked. Okay. So this type of multiple executions of the same application can be done using course C. Okay, so that's a syntax and then about intuitive understanding about what course C is doing. And what's going to be is a semantics. So let's look at three. Okay. What is it going to be the semantics? So to describe the semantics of a course C, we have to change the setup of our semantics. So if I go back to, to this setting, the semantics setting, most of the things are do not change. So green. So this part remains the same, but there's one big change that we are doing. We are saying that in our language, now the runtime types has a, will have a one more case, not just integer, Boolean, function, tuple, and alternative. We also have a one more case that corresponds to the continuation. So this, uh, the part that I wrote here. So we'll change. So then in old days we have, we in, we will, we function, topo, and we alternative. But now we're gonna add one more case that will correspond to continuation. So this really means the language, the some funda there is a some fundamental change in the language, which is 
previously before adding core CC and the throw, what kind the kind of things that we can denote by expressions in this language are one of those five kinds. But then by adding core CC and throw, the available values for the computation is changed to include one extra case called uh, continuation. Okay. So the, the semantic setup is changed like this. We almost the same, except that we include one more case in the isomorphism that indicates now the denotable value or values that can be produced by expressions in this language will have a one more kind that correspond to continuation. Continuation before this change was just a semantic device. After this change, continuation becomes a part of the programming language. So now what should we do? So we have to add, so this change in change in the isomorphism of V. So we added this V case. So that's a one change. And the second change that we have to do is we have to provide the how to interpret core CC and uh, yeah, core CC and throw. So here's an interpretation of core CC. So argument E. So interpretation is have always the same form. It takes environments and current continuation parameter. Okay, what should we do? So we have to, so we are expecting this E, the argument of the course C is a, func I mean, is a function. And then the function is expecting, I mean, we have to provide this current continuation as an argument of E, okay? We have, so as a parameter of E, in addition to just the typical way of, I mean, the, the usual way of passing the continuation. So here's what we do, we are saying, we first, uh, it's not quite right. We first compute the meaning of expression E under eta, but now we have a continuation. So which is what needs to be done next after evaluating E is going to be the following. It's so we we have to invoke E with the current continuation as an argument. So we we are given this function f, which is the result of evaluating E. So this is a big one. So and then we have to invoke f. And then functions, if you recall the function space is V to V continuation to V star. That was V one. So we have to provide the two arguments. One is for the real, the usual argument. The second is a continuation parameter as an argument. And what course C does is that it copy K and then provide K intuitively it provide K as first argument as well as the second argument. So you provide kappa as a second argument and as well as the first argument, but to provide it as a first argument, you have to embed this. So we have a I point kappa. And where this I point is a mapping from free continuation to values it's defined like I phone and so on. So if we take give our continuations, say K, we embed it to, it's a fifth case. So we embed it to K, the fifth case of the sum type. And then we convert it to the, to the V by using the isomorphism. But then intuitively what it does is that value have a multiple cases. We are just converting K, the, the, the continuation kappa to one of I mean, so such a way that it has the right type. Okay. 
but the the really what we happen is we can take current continuation copper and then we copy the current continuation and then we this copied one is passed as an argument of m and then the the other case is a throw e1 and e2 eta and copper and what we are expect to have what we expect to happen so we expect the, the evaluation of e1 to happen first which you have to provide a continuation so you will have to provide some continuation copper prime and then we want to evaluate e2 under the continuation copper prime not under the continuation copper so this one this copper will be ignored when he evaluates uh, e2 okay so let's write down the, the semantics based on this intuitive understanding so we first evaluate e1 on the eta and then the evaluation will produce a continuation so it will produce kappa, which is a weak continuation. So we have to do type testing and type casting. So we put count here. And then once the kappa is the kappa prime. So kappa, let's try the kappa one. Continuation is produced by, so this kappa one is bound to the continuation produced by expression E1 then we will evaluate E2 on the eta, but instead of using kappa, we are using just kappa one. So you see kappa is completely ignored when we run this throw operation. So that's, I mean, makes sense because the throw is a bit like go to, and when you do the go to, you completely change the control of the execution. So, so that's the semantics. Right. So, and then the last bit I want to talk about it, about this course is see and throw is some more extended example. From the textbook. Okay. So, so what, what this example illustrate? This example illustrate the, um, the we, by using this core CC and throw, we can implement something, some highly complicated uh, control, uh, the, the highly complicated behavior of comp execution. In particular, we, what we want to do here is we want to implement backtracking. So here's, here's a routine that we want to implement. So we want to implement some routine called backtrack. And then this backtrack take a function and that functions, so, yeah, take, so it, it takes a function, some functions, and that function's argument is called the A and B and A and B can be understood as a non-deterministic choice. Okay. So for instance, if we say something like this, so A and B take dummy parameter. So we, it talk, takes empty tuple, so this is with zero components. So if you say this, and then and then zero else one so else Two, else three. So if you write program like this, 
what we expect is that we backtrack out something magic so that this entire program will return essentially a list of all the possible values that we can obtain by evaluating A and B non-deterministically. So the first A and B may be true or false. If it's a true, the second A and B here can be true or false. And then the third A and B can be true or false as well. So if you count all these possibilities starting from the true, go all, and then the, the outcome is going to be three, the list which contain three, two, number one, zero, and so on. So zero is produced first because it's the choice true and true happens first. And then the one is produced next because the true and false happens next. And then the, the most recent one produced is added to the beginning of this list. Okay, so this is a kind of routine we want to implement. I mean, for something specific, like specific routines, like the one that we wrote here. Okay. I mean, of course, we can easily write programs that enumerate all the possibilities of of, I mean, the A and B, the, the result of calling this, this A and B function. But what we are interested in is that we want to write very generic function called backtrack. Okay, just once and for all. So if you write this generic function backtrack once, that generic function can be applied to any functions and the outcome will be all the possible enumerations of all the non-deterministic choices, under all the non-deterministic choices. Okay, so the question is how to do this. So we have to do a little bit of preparation to write this program because uh, in our, the language that we have, I mean, it's, so we need some macro, also we need to extend the language a little bit, but let's do this, okay, so the first thing we want to extend is that because we want to ex express the outcome as a list, so we introduce some macro that defines that, that let us express this type of a list. So, so we are writing something called new, that's going to be defined as alternative, the zeroth alternative with empty tuple. Okay. And then we have an operator called this, uh, in, in receipt terminology is called cons, but it's uh, adding some element to the list operation that is defined to be a first alternative of a pair. Then the pair contains a tuple with two components, E and E prime. Okay. And these things will be used to express the list like here. So how to express this? We said I mean, this, the, this list is nothing but three cons, two cons, one cons zero cons and nil. Okay. And this is how the the list is represented in OCaml Scala and so on. And, so, and then we are we, we introduce this these macros to to talk about lists like this. And I mean if we unpack this a bit more, this is the same as alternative, first alternative of a pair where the first component is three. And then we have, again, the first alternative pair, the second, the, the component is two, so on. First alternative, the element is one. First alternative element is zero. And then the last bit is, I mean, the, the zero, the second alternative, sorry about this. And then, then the, we have a zero alternative, which contains empty tuple and bunch of closed parentheses. Okay. And we, we're gonna introduce some more 
commands. Some, some another macro, that macro is called list case. Ah, sorry about this. I keep using the word, uh, the, I, I get keep confused myself about zero and one. So the zero means, so let's call it zeroth projection and first projection. Okay, it's, it just ignore second. I, I used to call zero, the at zero as the first component at one as the you know, first case at one as a second case, but let's call it zeroth case and first case, okay, instead of second case. So just just ignore second. Everything is either zeroth case and first case. Yeah. Okay. So so then we also add a one more macro that is called. Uh, or list case. So this is a case analysis of a list of E0 and E1. And this is defined by some case E of And the V dot E zero and and the V dot E one with a zero with a one. Okay. So what does it do? It the I mean if we do the case analysis, so we are expecting E is either nil or something let's write it like a current and the rest either new or current and rest so this correspond to the zeroth case this correspond to the first case okay. and if the argument e is new we just gonna return e0 i mean this here the v is a fresh variable so the Beforehand, if I mean, strictly speaking, that needs to be written like the sum case that I wrote here. But intuitively, if argument E is nil, we just return E0. If argument E is a non nil list, so list contains at least one element, then we're going to invoke E1 with the C as a first parameter, R as a second parameter. So that's what this macro definition tells us. And this is the typical pattern match that you can find in programming languages, I mean, typical functional languages. Okay, so then a few, sorry about so many definitions, but because it's, I mean, the program of backtrack is quite simple, but to write this, we need uh, some, some tools in the language. Okay, so these are the, three cases, nil, and then the cons and the list case. And the, the other two are some convenient macro. So we're gonna write as a let we try the x. Let x e in e prime to mean that functions, function application prime e. But this led expression will make things a bit, I mean, much easier to express about sequencing. So we first evaluate e, bind each result to x, and then continue the evaluation of e prime. And the last bit is we're gonna sometimes write it e and semicolon e prime to mean that so let's go fresh. So we don't care when we do the sequencing, if we don't care about the value of the first expression E, then we're gonna write the, I mean, this is sequencing operate, I mean, the, the, instead of using let, 
So we just write as using semicolon operation. Okay. Now, so this is the macro that we are defining. But to express the, to implement the backtrack, we have to do a bit more, which is we have to introduce the so-called state or memory cell. So we will, our expression will now include a few more cases. So in the textbook, I think not this chapter, but in the next chapter, the, this extension is handled much more thoroughly. But for, for us, I think we just studied this to solve this problem. And then the, this is a bit like a uh, malloc in C or new in, in, uh, in Java. Okay. So we can create a memory cell. So make reference. So what this instruction does is that we create a memory cell and we, which is initialized by its parameter expression. So these are all about the memories, uh, computer memory. And then the second one is about dereferencing the memory cell. In C, we use a star, but here we're gonna use bar exp. That means, so this make ref, it creates some memory cell to so say, if you call mk ref three, it create memory cell initialized to three and it returns its address as a result. And var means it takes its expression, has to be this address. And if you take this address, it does lookup of that address and return the value three here, in this case. And one, another thing that we can do is assignment. It's P, it's P. So left-hand side of assignment, we give an address. So we give address like A. The right-hand side, we give a values that needs to be stored in the address, like number 10. So if you run this command, my memory before the command, it contains three, but after the, this instruction expression, my memory A, cell A will contain number 10. Okay. Then finally, you can compare two references by writing like this. So we can compare like whether A, reference A is the same as reference B and so on. And this is, we are not going to use this. We are mainly gonna use the first three. Okay. So in functional language, what's perhaps not very familiar to you is that we can create reference of something like integers, but we can also create something like reference of functions or reference of list of functions, list of continuations and so on. So that's what we're gonna do now, okay, in this language. So for using all this, like some something for the list, and some abbreviations, and also this memory cell, the manipulation of the memory cells where we can, we're now gonna implement this backtrack. So what I'm gonna do is that I will write some backbone of a backtrack and I will explain to you about what they are supposed to do. And then, but I will leave some holes so that you can fill in the holes, okay? So here's an implementation of backtrack. So it takes function f. Now note that what this function, it, it's fun, this f itself is a function because if you look at the uses of backtrack. So backtrack is taking this yellow function that's written here. And that function is expect to take a and b. So what backtrack have to do is that it takes some function and it provides 
this a and b value to the function. Okay. That's what you have to do. So it uh, takes f. Then what it has to do is that you have to define something appropriate and then apply that something appropriate to f. So that's what needs to be done. And to do so, it creates two memory cells. So the first memory cell is for RL. This is the list of the results. And then the memory cell is created by calling make ref with the, it's a list and it initially contains new. So it's an empty list. So this is for the results storing result of calling f under various non-determinism. Okay. And then we also create something called CL. This is again a list. And what this list is supposed to do is that it store the list of continuations. Because non-deterministic choice means that we make one choice and finish the computation. And then we have to come back and make, should make a different choice. So this, all those different choices will be stored in this continuation CL. Okay, so now there's just some instruction. So we, what we do, we update our, the result. Now we update the result by calling function f with something. And then add this, the result of calling f to the current list RL. So this is like, we are adding, we invoke F, outcome of invoking F is gonna be added to RL. Okay. Right. And then once we do this and we do the case analysis, this case. So this is a semicolon and we do the case analysis and say, if the current continuation, the list of current continuation is we do case analysis about whether the list of current continuation is empty or not. And if it's an empty, then we just return the results of the, the list of the results that we have at the moment. Otherwise, we have to do some work, okay? Otherwise, the continuations is gonna be split as some continuation K and the rest of the continuation, which is gonna be list L. And what we do is we update our CL list to contain the rest. So we take out one element from this list of continuation. And then we, okay. And then what we do is that we invoke continuation K with parameter false. So, so if there be this continuation K is something appropriate, calling with the parameter false, we're amount to do the following. So we said, if you look at this example, so if when we call this in second M First, let's look at the first guy. Um, it's not, so some sync problem. Okay. So when we call this first M, the first result of A and B is going to be true. Okay. But if we somehow manage to grab the current continuation of this A and B, in other words, if we have managed to put some label L here, okay, so then next time the 
the next event things that we want to evaluate, which is that we want to evaluate this A and B under false, can be done by jumping to L with a value false. So we put label L and then return true. That's going to continue the execution. And then if we want to come back and try something different, because we want to implement non-deterministic choice, the way we can do it is we jump to L and then return false there. Okay. So then that's, we can run the same program under the different choice there. And this instruction that I wrote, is implementing just exactly what I told you. But for this to work, okay, this K, continue, current continuation, I mean, K or kappa, this current continuation has to be chosen appropriately. And that choice of the continuation has to be done in this place. So the question I want you to think about is, how should you write the argument of this function F so that this backtrack is going to work correctly? So I will give you five minutes so that you can think about what to put there. Let's give, let me give you more hints. Okay. So for the arguments of F will be this A and B. So A and B is a function that take dummy argument like empty tuple. So this A and B is the one we have to uh, provide the, to the function F, okay? So, the, so the really the question I'm asking is how to implement this A and B okay. and using what we have at the point. So because A and B is a function, at least you can write, it takes function argument U, but this is a dummy argument, which is not going to be used at all. Now you have to write a body of this.
Okay, so the answer is actually quite simple. So the body is gonna be run when, I mean, this I said this corresponds to A and B, when A and B is invoked, okay? And what we have to do? So when A and B is invoked first, we have to return true, but then we, when all the computation is finished, we have to go back to this invocation of A and B and try everything again on the, the, the different result, which is a false. So we have to grab the continuation, of course, you see. Okay, so let me, I need more space. So it's a box and this box is written here. So we have, we grab continuation used by calling course CC. Okay. And then we store this continuation to CL. Okay, so CL or list of continuation is now, is gonna, is going to grow by storing K. By putting, we put K to the beginning of this list of continuations. So that when later, when everything is done, we are able to call, when we call this throw data, I mean, this current places will be revisited. And now after storing this continuation, we just return true. So that's the instruction we can write. And if we write it this way, then we can implement this backtracking operation. So this backtracking operation itself is not so important, but the important bit is that using that, that the way you can use, I mean, I hope that although the example is a bit complex, it give you uh, some idea about how to use core CC and throw to implement something highly non-obvious. Okay. So, so that's the part about continuation and maybe in the remaining seven minutes, I'm gonna talk a bit about defunctionalization. Maybe the right way to say is semantic. So, I mean, this type of idea is used in compiler. So in fact, I think one of the paper from John Reynolds, which perhaps is, I mean, if you follow the link in the course webpage, you maybe have a, explained this idea of defunctionalization syntactically. It has a syntactic version of this defunctionalization. And so it's used in the compiler, but at the same time, if you are the one who study a little bit about object-oriented languages, then OO semantics is often used to some very similar kind of idea. Okay. So what's the problem that this, this semantic defunctionalization or first order semantics try to solve? So the problem this first of the semantics tried to solve from purely semantic perspective is that the semantics denotation of semantics we talked about is so complex. Especially we have to develop the large amount of tools from domain theory, uh, which led us to show this uh, fixed point equations, this isomorphism, which involves some functions where the function defined on the function space. And just to show the existence of such a space, we have to develop a large amount of machinery to I mean a large amount of machinery. On the other hand, if you do so, we get a very nice semantics like functions means proper mathematical functions. And, and then the semantics also validate many more program equations. But suppose we are less concerned about the quality of the semantics. We just want a semantics that will help us to do something like maybe compile a construction or to do just some justification of some reasoning principle or program analysis. So then what should we do? Okay, 
is there any some quick way of solving and constructing semantics which is not involving this highly advanced mathematics so can you avoid this so and then there is one more case for the people. So the idea of th this uh, first of the denotational semantics, and uh, not fun continuation. So the idea of a first of the denotational semantics is to, I mean, okay. So let, let me just before talking about this, there was a interpretation function. Let's take expression to environments continuation this time. Okay, so the idea about uh, th this part of the semantics is that let's try to build spaces like something for functions and something for continuation, something for values using some syntactic instructions, using some syntax. So the semantic domains that's going to be built in this first order denotational semantics is a bit like a space of some structured instructions. So each space, I mean, talk about some sense instructions, it's a, it, 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 it talk about instructions, I mean, that denotes either functions or continuation and so on. So it be becomes more like we are constructing each spaces using syntax instead of using mathematical concepts like functions and so on. And then, so the, the two key ideas. First idea is build spaces using syntax or instructions. The second idea is to provide interpretation of these semantic instructions in space. in those spaces. So these are the two key ideas. So we build the spaces using syntax or some syntactic instructions. So really these spaces can be understood as a spaces that contain a bunch of instructions. So these instructions doesn't tell me about how, how to do function application, okay? But to do, so some there are spaces, there's gonna be a space which contains instruction for functions, but they, they are far from the mathematical function. But then we will provide some interpretation functions that will convert elements in these functions, in, in this space for the functions as appropriate functions. So I will only give you an overview about this semantics. And then I will, perhaps if you are interested, you can take, have a look at the textbook or my handwritten note. Right, so and then I will give you overview for the language with only integers and function canonical forms. So we are not going to support integers and functions in this case. And so then this, we just like any denotation as the most important bit is to set spaces. So here we have uh, some space called free star that is defined to be space for the value together with the two type of errors. So, so far very similar. Button. 
And then we, it's also defined in terms of isomorphism, but this isomorphism is much simpler. Okay, so P, it's not, a, okay, let it be aside. And we have a one case for integers. So this integer is the same as before, the set of integers. But then we have something strange called Greek one and something strange for Greek continuation. So actually there are integer functions and there's one more case continuation canonical form. So we are only supporting three runtime types, uh, the integers, functions, and uh, uh, continuations. And then the we conti this uh, continuation, this function space is not defined as a function space, okay? It's defined as something very syntactic. So we said it's a topo. Times variables. So we are also, I'm not going to talk about this E hat, but there E hat is also defined in the, in a very similar way, but that represents environments, space for the environments. But you see that the definition of we had function is not talking about function, it's a tuple. So typical element here is a tuple. The first component is always abstract. That indicates this is a lambda abstraction. And the second component is a variable. Third is, so this represents the parameter. The third represents the body of the function. The fourth represents the environments that has to be, that is available when this function is defined. And this environment provides the meaning for, for all the free variable in the expression. So it's a very syntactic definition, but we use these syntactic definitions to talk about this semantics. And I'm not going to talk about weak continuation. It's a complex, but the, the weak, this weak continu head continuation is defined in a very similar syntactic way. Another way to view this is every element is weak continuation are records or tuples of certain kind. And now, so that corresponds to this first aspect that I talked about. The second aspect is now, if you just write it like this, then we can't do anything because we want to apply these functions. So we have to provide in the semantics, in addition to provide this interpretation function, we have to define a few more. And so we have to define for the function case, we have to define some Another function called apply, what it does is that it takes elements in this we had fun and then it map it to a fun proper function. Okay, it map it to function that take value and we had continuation and return we had this right. And so continue, continuous function space. Okay. So another way to understand this apply is we take this type of a tuple and then we interpret this tuple as appropriate function so that we can apply. So in this first, that's the kind of idea of the first of the semantics. We build a space syntactically so that each space really is populated by some very, some abstract instructions or semantic instructions. And then we also provide this extra function like apply and that tells us how we should understand these semantic instructions in spaces into like a functions or continuations, which we can apply and use, okay? So that's the roughly the idea. And sorry for going so much over time. So that's it for, the, for this part. And thank you all. And thank you for attending this lecture. And I hope to see you next week. <laughs>